Psychology in Seattle. Hey, deserving listeners. Today we have a special guest, Hannah Bronson, who won our most recent scholarship, $2,500 from Psychology in Seattle. She had submitted her application along with dozens of others. And the Psychology in Seattle team, uh, it was a hard choice, particularly down to like the, the last five or so. But Hannah really uh, stuck out as the clear winner because she is not only a clinician who is helping people through music therapy and general therapy, but she, in her spare time, which a lot of novice therapists don't really have, she has been dedicating herself to changing uh, society and changing systems and integrating programs, particularly into the military, to help people with PTSD and head trauma. And I, you know, in the application, she described it and she didn't go into detail, but I knew behind all that effort or all behind the sort of tagline was a tremendous amount of effort and uh, worry. And, you know, when you're doing this kind of work, when you're advocating for new programs, particularly with the United States government, you're going to find that there's barriers, there's resistance, and there's questions and uncertainty. You could spend three years of your life dedicating yourself to some effort that could just not go anywhere. And so uh, I, I just really wanted to reward her hard work to try to make the world a better place and um, have her on the show to talk about it. So welcome to the show, Hannah. Thank you for having me. I'm excited to be here. So let's introduce the podcast. This is called the Psychology in Seattle podcast. I'm your host, Dr. Kirk Honda. I'm a therapist and a professor. Hannah, can you please introduce yourself to podcast land? Sure. My name is Hannah Bronson, and I'm a board-certified music therapist. I've spent the majority of my professional career working with active duty military populations across the country um, at different uh, military installations. And currently I'm in Austin, Texas, and I'm in a bit of a transition. I'll be moving into a doctoral program in clinical psychology in a couple of weeks and moving to Denver, Colorado. So a lot of exciting transition things are happening for me. Right. In addition to your efforts in the past and plans to make tremendous efforts to make the world a better place. In your essay, you talked about how this move is going to be rough on the, the old bank account. And uh, so the scholarship is intended to help with that. Oh, incredibly helpful and just easing my anxiety in, in the best way possible. So thanks. Thanks again to you and the Psychology in Seattle team and all the podcast listeners and patrons specifically. Um, it's really helping me out. So thanks to them. Right. It's all the patrons money. And the last detail that I'll say is that as a happy bonus, you've been a listener for a long time. Is that right? Yeah, I think I discovered the podcast. Um, it had to have been like early 2013 when I was like fresh out of my internship and driving all across Southern California to different sites. And just trying to make use of, of that time in my car and discovered the podcast and, and, have haven't stopped listening since so it's been really helpful yeah so tell us about what you've been doing to make the world a better place well like i said i've been working with military population since um i was an intern um after i graduated from my music therapy degree program in 2012 and that was kind of my first encounter with this population and if you think about what was going on in the world at that time there were thousands and thousands of service members coming back from combat deployments with um, injuries, physical injuries, mental injuries, and um, in just in a, into a system that didn't have the capacity fully to um, assist everyone to the best of their ability. So there was really a call to the community to um, help in whatever way they could. And being a music therapist in the San Diego area at the time, um, it was really kind of an obvious answer to do what we could to understand the needs of these people. And I had no prior experience working with the military and there were no music therapists at that time 
working anywhere with active duty service members. There were certainly a lot of us working in the VA, um, but there wasn't any kind of research to turn to or um, even resources that would direct us in how to best construct programming. And so from that early stage, it was a lot of learning and developing and kind of finding out what um, the best way to serve um, the military would be and growing from there. And I'm excited to say now that seven years later, there's a whole team of music therapists across the country who are starting new programs and um, we're learning a lot through research and developing best practices and just refining what we do. So it's been an exciting journey to be a pioneer and, and just see this field answer the call to a really important population that, that means a lot to me. And I know a lot of other communities and just civilians as well. So a lot of this is due to you and your colleagues spending the time doing research, getting it published and lobbying decision makers to integrate music therapy into the offerings for active duty service members. Do I have that right? Yeah. So tell, um, us, tell us about that because I've never done anything like that. I've never had to <laughs> convince the government to allow me to uh, insert something brand new, you know, because music therapy for some, they're like, so what, you just sit around in a circle and bang on drums like that. That's not real therapy. It has a similar <laughs> kind of stigma or misunderstanding as art therapy or drama therapy. And uh, yeah. so how, how did you do that? Oh, man, lots of blood, sweat, and tears is the, is the short answer. Um, but really, I think in the early stages, and it's kind of funny to think back and reflect on it now, because now we have such incredible support from um, congressional funding and from the DOD actually creating positions, federal positions for creative arts therapists, for art and music therapists specifically, which is just groundbreaking that that's, that's really a sign that a system is changing is when they want to instill something permanently um, for continuity and sustainability purposes. But I'm thinking back to like the early days, I was working for a nonprofit called Resounding Joy in San Diego, and they had grant funding from various sources, such as Wounded Warrior Project and specific military um, organizations. And so we would kind of find an advocate on post or in the community or even in local government that was a champion and had a voice that would get behind what we were doing and really believed in it when, you know, a good majority, like you said, of the people who we would show up on base with a, a car full of drums or guitars or instruments and people would, you know, kind of look at us sideways and say, okay, well, like, where do you, where do you fit into this, this picture? Um, so I think a lot of it in the beginning was just believe by seeing by seeing the impact that music had on service members and in in their recovery um, and having them really tell that story and then um, just really creative ways of, of finding spaces that would allow us to you know offer our services so I, I remember thinking back to 2012 or 2013 we we're working in the wounded warrior battalion on camp pendleton in san diego and i would show up at formation at like 7 30 in the morning with dunkin donuts and say hey i'm a music therapist and i have this program whoever wants to come and check it out because we at that time it was hard to get referrals from clinicians who just didn't understand exactly who we were what we did and then really the service members were the ones saying like hey we want more of this, this is helpful to us. So what do you do exactly to help these folks? So it looks differently. Um, I'm gonna talk specifically about military, but music therapy in general um, looks a lot of different ways based on the population that you work with. And uh, just a quick definition of music therapy is that it's the use of music within a therapeutic relationship as the agent of change um, with your patient or your client. And that's to improve functioning across different domains. It could be cognitive, emotional, social, um, spiritual even. And in the case of the people that I work with who have um, oftentimes a combination of different diagnoses and that interact and create a really complex presentation. So you mentioned post-traumatic stress disorder, maybe multiple concussions or traumatic brain injuries, and then maybe chronic pain or other physical injuries on top of that. So a lot of those symptoms are interconnected and interlinked. And 
just can create really a lot of suffering for the people that have them. And music works in amazing ways. And I think two of the most important ways that music works, number one is it functions in the brain differently than most other activities that we engage in. It's, I like to think of it as kind of a full body workout for your brain. So it's engaging most, multiple regions simultaneously and creating opportunity for rebuilding neural connections, rehabilitating speech, language, motor functions, cognition. Um, but then in addition to that, music moves us emotionally and um, can connect us to ourselves and other people in ways that sometimes don't necessarily happen just with spoken language or having a conversation. We can all think about times when we've heard a song that reminds us of a specific event or moves us to tears and we don't fully understand why. Um, so it can be a really powerful tool to kind of address these different areas of functioning and, and help people access healing in a different way. Yeah. So it sounds like on some level for some people, there's an unspoken benefit to uh, the work that you do with them, that it helps to, um, as you say, to utilize all their, you know, different parts of their brain. And if they are suffering from, uh, you know, people, so I can imagine, you can tell me if this is what happens. People, they go to um, active duty, uh, you know, overseas, and they are, they experience some kind of trauma and the trauma can be classic, like literally seeing someone die right in front of you or Mm -hmm. even, even having to kill people is actually traumatic a lot for people or shooting at people being shot at also just the ongoing terror of, is this the day that my uh, Jeep gets blown up or is this the day that a mortar comes you know, into my room or something. And yeah. there's this, even if you never see any actual firefighting, there's this worry every day and uh, that's very real and that can be traumatizing too. So, so they have this extreme, uh, you know, traumatic fear-based survival-based experience that uh, does something to people's brains. If you, if you do it for mm-hmm. a prolonged period of time, they come back to the United States and they're still in that heightened arousal state, even when they're quote unquote relaxing and their, their body is uh, either suffering from actual PTSD or just general trauma and anxiety and disconnection from other people, maybe even disconnected from their bodies because that's one of the ways that humans uh, cope with traumas to cut themselves off from their bodies. It actually really works, but of course it has downsides to it. And of course, these individuals, many of them have been traumatized before they even entered the military. So yeah. those kinds of things get triggered. And then they're you know back to the United States and they still are suffering ongoing. They might be drinking a lot. They might be using drugs a lot to, to self-medicate. They might be... Um, disconnected. They might feel disconnected from other people. They might be depressed. They obviously might be anxious. And uh, am I painting a picture of, of this sort of folks? Oh, absolutely. Yeah, definitely. And I think you mentioned a couple of really important things like the prolonged exposure to stress. And then add on top of that, um, you know, compounded traumas, complicated grief, these small concussions or brain injuries that may happen over time that they don't have time to recover from or maybe don't even get diagnosed or documented. So that like the environment in the brain that happens um, over sometimes decades for some people feels really normalized for a lot of them, um, which also creates a really hard barrier to seeking treatment to so they have uh, brain injuries from explosions or from from what kind of stuff? Yeah, so uh, there's, if you think about the recent war there, and I'm talking about Iraq and Afghanistan, um, the the tactics that have been used primarily are um, IEDs, or improvised explosive devices, which are, there's sort of two parts to this. There's the potential trauma, emotional trauma that comes from that unpredictability that I think you mentioned of like, when are we going to get mortared? Like, is our convoy going to roll over this? 
explosive device, but then also the blast exposure that sometimes can not physically impact someone um, on the outside, but we like to call it the invisible wounds of these consistent blast exposures that have a severe impact on the brain over time. And um, if you think about the recommendations for concussion, where you're supposed to take two weeks off and not um, overly stress yourself out and avoid any screens and stop going to work, that that just doesn't happen in a combat situation. So the brain doesn't have time to recover. And so when you're working with them through uh, music, the research shows what sort of thing? So there's a lot of exciting um, groundwork laid on exploring how music impacts the brain. And I'm, and we're just getting, we're scratching the surface on understanding it. And I think that's sort of how it is in general in neuroscience. And I wish I was an expert specifically on all of the you know intricate workings of music in the brain, but there are some um, great studies out there that, early on showed us that when comparing the brains of musicians to non-musicians specifically, I think vocalists, that there's a specific track of fibers called the arcuate fasciculus, which is a really fun word to say, um, that is noticeably larger in musicians. So exposure to musical training um, strengthens this pathway between, I think, the Broca's area and the Bernanke's area of expressive and receptive language. So what that implies is that um, even if that person is not trained in music in music therapy, we can expose them to a period of music learning and improve speech function. So this is often, most often in our field, used with people who are recovering from stroke um, or any kind of other acute brain injury or illness. And there's great implications for um, concussion as well that we hope to better understand through more research. So the idea is, is that by either activating this already somewhat robust pathway in the brain or building it up, it helps to, uh, it improves brain function, which might improve one's mood and increase one's ability to cope with life. Is, is that the thought? Yeah, that's definitely a part of it. And if you think about music too, and we say the term you know, drug, sex, and rock and roll, all of these things that activate um, the pleasure and the reward system in the brain, it's a very real thing. Like our brains are activating and uh, releasing dopamine and um, in a, a brain that needs recovery or rehabilitation, um, the dopamine is actually really helpful in, in improving function. So if you feel good during therapy, if you feel good during your throughout your day and your mood is improved then you're going to get better faster and that's sort of the the core of the why do you give people an idea of specifically what it looks like because i imagine some people out there are just thinking like i i don't understand what what do you mean by using music like paint a picture for people yeah um it can look like a lot of different things and i'm talking a lot about you know the really the technical part of of cognition and there's a lot of music music therapists out there that practice a a brand of music therapy called neurologic music therapy that's really based in that um i feel a little bit more integrated in my approach and it a, a typical session might look like us playing instruments together so i'll sit down with um a person who wants to learn guitar, maybe used to play guitar before they were in the military. And we're using that as a therapeutic tool. So there's the active adaptively learning that um, is great for cognition and all those, you know, great things going on in the brain that we mentioned, but then also kind of the relational aspect of, of interpersonally creating something with another person. Um, maybe it's selecting a song that has some deep significance to them, whether it's a fallen battle buddy or a song that expresses some piece of what they're going through. Or maybe we're going to write a song together that they're actually putting their words and their experiences into musical format as a tool for just processing and expressing. And then maybe even sharing that with friends or family. Um, so there can be lots of different layers to that. And I work with individuals, but also do a lot of work in groups. and. What I love about working in groups is that music is naturally a social, um, and 
it's an opportunity for social engagement. If you think historically, music's always been something that cultures across history have done to bring people together. Um, and so for someone with trauma who might tend to isolate or, or avoid social situations, it's a really natural motivator and way to engage without having to sit and, and talk. So it feels a lot more accessible and enjoyable and um, whether that's playing instruments, talking about music, listening to music, creating maybe even just a soundtrack of songs that um, have some relation to your to your life or personal significance. Or sometimes we do um, lyric analysis, which is picking a song that we sit down either in a group or individual, listen to the song and analyze what the artist is trying to say, either verbally through their lyrical content or non-verbally and kind of opens the dialogue. Um, for a discussion on whatever thematic content comes up. So in those situations, do you know the clients pretty well or might this be the one and only time you meet these people? So it depends really on the setting. I'll talk about the clinic I've most recently worked in. Um, we kind of have two layers. We have an outpatient clinic where we get um, I get referrals sent to me and I maybe will work with that person over the span of eight weeks. So I'm doing, you know, a typical assessment and then building a treatment plan. And then in the group situation, we have a six-week intensive outpatient program where they're receiving treatment for specifically trauma in the form of cognitive processing therapy. So writing a trauma narrative and reading it um, in a group format. And so I, I, a lot of times I'm meeting them on day one. And then by the end of the six weeks, um, we have written a song together as a group and are performing it for their family. So it's kind of an intensive way to, you know, deliver music therapy in a group like that. Um, but yeah, it can look a lot of different ways in, in hospital settings, music therapists, sometimes we'll see a patient for one encounter. And then that's that you've got that one hour to tr- diagnose or not diagnose to assess to treat and terminate. Um, so it can be really brief or it can be more long-term. Do you ever get people who say, oh, I'm not musical? Oh, every day. <laughs> I would say that's like the number one, even people who have played music before, there's sort of this uh, cultural belief that musicians are, it's like a, you either are or you aren't. And the whole uh, culture of you know, America's Got Talent and American Idol has, you know, not done much to help this, but um, that you either have the capacity to be musical or be a musician or you don't. And uh, I think it's my opinion and probably most music therapists that that just isn't true and that music is such a a part of who we are as humans. And yeah, maybe we don't have the technical proficiency to perform at a, you know, high level, but that doesn't matter because we all listen to music. We all understand it in some way. Um, even if it's just from being exposed to it throughout our lives. And that's actually, there's actually a lot in there that you can pull from as a music therapist and, and, and support people in accessing creativity and expression um, in a lot of different ways. So it's, it's our job to make people feel comfortable in that. And that's, that's actually a big part of the therapeutic process too, I think. Yeah. The part of it that I often will say or think about is, that in the past, music was, you know, today we have professional pop stars who they're uh, on MTV, they're interviewed in, you know, celebrity, they're celebrities, right? They're and mm-hmm. the best of the best of the best, right? The best guitarist in the world, the best rapper in the world, the best dancer slash singer in the world. And in the past, 100 years ago, they're we didn't have that. We, you could, you could go to a theater if you were rich or you lived near a theater and actually see professionals, but 99.9% of the time, and you didn't have radio and you didn't have maybe, you know, records didn't exist 150 years ago. And the only way you had, the only way you could listen to music is if you played it or someone in your family played it and you would sit around, uh, you know, with the people you knew and you would just play it. And, and the, music was uh mass produced music was initially sold through sheet music you, you know you would you would buy the the piano uh sheet music and you would play it at home and sing it and so it was folksy it was something in your home that 
uh, everyone and maybe you know your sister played uh, mandolin better than you but you played piano better than your sister and your dad uh did this you know but everyone played a part because you had to there's the only way you could like recreate music and mm-hmm. it was communal and uh and expressive for everyone it wasn't just something you did passively and that's our probably our natural state i i'm quite sure that if we had a time machine went back 50,000 years that music was a part of our lives i mean imagine you know that everyone did it in your village or your tribe or something on some level whether it was while you're in the fields uh you know harvesting the crop you're you're singing a song or you're singing a song to your kids as they fall asleep or you're singing a song as you cook or or you're you know banging on a thing to keep rhythm for people to <laughs> do this or that you know it was it was a thing that we just did and it because it, it's it's we love music so imagine us without the radio without mtv uh, and without mp3 players we would um you know that's where it all comes from and so uh, we've lost that connection personally uh, for many of us because of that notion that well unless you're you know really really good you don't deserve to even try which is you know quite a quite a travesty so you work with people to um, get them to move past that is that right yeah I mean you you said it exactly right and I think people surprise themselves too. Like one of the the first things that I do with a new group of of service members is group rhythm or percussion. Um, Because rhythm is just kind of the the easiest, most accessible way to to create music. And um, it's, I think people surprise themselves. You know, we'll get a bunch of people on drums and other percussion instruments and I'll just direct like very briefly how you play that instrument and then we'll play something together and they're all looking at each other like oh dang that's kind of really good like yeah let's do that again um so yeah I think we it's the expectations that we have about ourselves and maybe even a bad experience with like a, a music teacher early on who said like oh you're not you're not good enough for this or like try this instrument instead instead you're not good at that or you can't sing in tune um that i mean that can impact us for for life and on a really deep developmental level and as a music therapist i think about how important that is not just in music but in your capacity to try new things and to take risks in general so you yeah, I mean, that. you play instruments, right? I do. Viola is my primary instrument, but I also play guitar and piano and sing and a bunch of other random stuff. <laughs> What's your primary instrument? Viola. Oh, viola. Okay. Yeah, it's funny because, yeah. uh, so, you know, I'm a musician too. And the uh, thing that I will say when someone asks me that I don't know that well, they'll be like, so, you know, do you, do you play an instrument or something? And I almost always say something like, yeah, you know, I kind of, I kind of mess around, but that's not really true because <laughs> I've, I've been playing musical instruments that, in some shape or form since I was in grade school. And, and I am highly dedicated to my craft and have practiced a lot and bought a lot of instruments and uh, played <laughs> a lot with other people and been literally paid money to perform and still do. And yeah. if, if that doesn't qualify me as someone who doesn't just <laughs> fiddle around, I don't know what does. Uh, I think you're pretty legit. I'll say that. So, but it's funny how uh, even someone like me who, you know, someone like you and me who actually uh, is definitely, you know, out there doing stuff and, and confident in one's music ability and, uh, you're mm-hmm. making a living from your, uh, from your, you know, integrating your music into your therapy work. And, and I make a little bit of money from, you know, professional gigs and whatnot and, and have done so for 35 years or something. It's like, it's, it's even, even I will, will downplay it because, because mm-hmm. I think it's like, I think part of it is people will consider you bragging if you say you're a, oh, you, yeah. you're a musician. I was gonna say it's the whole ego thing. Like musicians, apparently, like famous ones 
are thought to have like this ego presence kind of thing and you don't want to be that so just downplay your abilities and then people won't won't see you that way i guess that's that's how i perceive it but yeah it's 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 interesting and uh really far afield from i think what is natural for us so when you're working with people uh you 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 get them past that initial um insecurity or or construct around you have to be this awesome uh you know super famous musician to call yourself or to even pick up an instrument kind of futz around with it Mm -hmm. um so what benefits do you hear clients saying about this work specifically? Yeah, they definitely range from, you know, really immediate responses to like after we engage in some kind of improv- improvisation or music making, I'll ask the question, like, what were you thinking about while you were playing the drum? And they'll kind of have this moment of insight, like, uh just playing the drum or I wasn't thinking about anything. And that's a totally new experience for a lot of people to not be ruminating on, you know, unwanted thoughts or to be thinking about what's coming next or to be focused on, you know, their own self-perception in a group of new people, but that the music making takes them out of that thought loop and engages them in, in the activity in the moment. And, um, you know, if you're talking about mindfulness, that's such a powerful experience to have and even if it's brief for some people that's the first time that they've they've had that sensation and um, just a lot of benefit to that and then of course through more progressive long-term treatment um, people saying things like you know this is the first thing that I've ever encountered that allows me to truly express my feelings or like to really feel understood or heard um, or something that I can engage in that doesn't make me angry you know like you come back from um a situation where your coping mechanism was physical you know exercise or sport or um some kind of physical engagement and then you have an injury and now your coping mechanism is completely gone and you have nothing else that helps you release emotions or aggression or anger um that's a tough place to be in for a lot of people and how do you find a way to express things and um, soothe, like self soothe and, and cope on your own? Um, maybe picking up a guitar is the way to do that for some people and they find that. And then it's like, this is the thing. Like I feel motivated. It's challenging me in a new way. It helps me feel better. It helps me forget about my pain. And it's something that I can choose when I do it. And it's also not pharmaceutical. So a lot of people are really averse to taking prescription medications for good reason. Um, and this is just another way that they can do it on their own and, and feel empowered to take control of your symptoms. Yeah, I don't know about you, but I can't tell you how many times I have uh, been in that state where I'm a little off kilter or a lot off kilter. And the sort of um, random pastime that I do is I pick up my acoustic guitar and I either futz around with a song that I've written that I like to play or I'll, or I'll sing I'll, and a song mm-hmm. that, I, that I've written. And the songs that I have written express something inside of me that I can't put into words. Even prior to writing lyrics for songs, they will be that way. And uh, so, uh, and then I feel... And yeah, I forget about, you can't really think about anything else because you're, you have to be in the zone to actually concentrate on what's happening. And yeah. when you become proficient in something and you know a song really well, particularly one that you write, it's, it, it just kind of flows out of you. And it's, a, it's an expressive act, which is obvious to say, but somehow I don't I really have the, any other words for it. You know, it, it, there's a, an, a, inner expression that happens that I don't think can happen in any other form. And we have this culture that uh, downplays all of therapy, but the the type of therapy that is uh, usually thought of and usually thought of as legit is, is talk therapy, which is legit, but it's just one way to access one's thoughts and feelings and experiences. And it's just one way to connect with other human beings. And although great for some people, it's either not 
the most direct path or it's too much for them or, or whatever. And to create a space for art or music or dance mu- movement, uh, these kinds of expressions provide the body and soul with a way to humanistically go towards what the body and the mind and the soul need to heal in a way that um, maybe talk therapy can't really provide for people. And it's like a straight shot right to the heart of the matter for some people. And whereas Mm -hmm. if you sit down in front of them and say, okay, you know, tell me about your feelings, tell me about what happened to you. uh, There's defenses. We start intellectualizing. You can't really intellectualize Mm -hmm. while you're, while you're jamming on a drum, you know, (laughs) know, or or you're singing a song. You You can't, you can't uh, separate yourself from it. Uh, you have to. You have to. You have to surrender yourself to the unspoken, um, non cog. You know, non central. You know, yeah. conscious idea of what's happening, and and uh, it is chaos. Uh, I imagine mm-hmm. f- from your standpoint, because it's like, well, God knows, I don't. You know, for some of your clients, you're like, I, I don't really know these people that well. Or even if you did, you're just like, I don't know what's going to happen because I can't really direct it because I can't even really check in with them, right? I can't even say like, what's happening? Yeah. Uh, it's like something's happening. I don't know. And now they're crying or something. And you just might not ever know. Like, well, I don't even know what just happened right there. And that, right. Um, you know, for some people, you just can't really get there with talk therapy, right? Absolutely. And, um, you know, you mentioned that like feeling of chaos or just uncertainty and as a, I mean, even myself, say, like, at the beginning of starting to write a song with a patient, I don't know where it's going to go. They don't know where it's going to go. We're really, like, in that process together, and I'm there to best support them in structuring and articulating whatever it is that needs to come out, whether it's in metaphor of the song lyrics. Sometimes it's easier to talk in metaphor or a specific feeling or mood that they want to create with the music. So, Um, I'm really helping them like using my musical knowledge to help them craft that. And they're able to tell me like, yes, like you, you nailed it. But a lot of times it's not verbally. They're not saying like, this is exactly what I want to express. They might be able to say, okay, so there's this song that, you know, really gets to that feeling that I'm trying to go for. And we might listen to the song together and try to create something usually using a similar chord progression or instrumentation um, or structure of the song or genre. Um, and I'm just using, you know, kind of contextual clues to help them figure it out. And we don't know what the end state is going to look like or sound like. And when it gets to that place, it's really, it's been about the process rather than the, the product of the song itself. It's, it's really more about um, having that person find new ways to express things and, and, that maybe aren't as clear or as evident or as straightforward as we might think would be in talk therapy because they can't, they physically trauma blocks a lot of that um, in terms of how we can put things into words and, and kind of scatters our memories in different ways. And it can be expressed through the body rather than just through straight conversation. Um, And music gets to that too. We can think about how when you hear a song, sometimes you feel it in your body first and and you know, like that hit something that that struck a chord, (laughs) pardon the pun. Um, But that's, yeah, that's really, that's really what it's about. When did you fall in love with music therapy? Because I'm guessing it wasn't necessarily something you might not have even known about because it's it's not a very uh, widely known or understood form of therapy. Yeah, I didn't, I actually didn't really know much about it when I decided that would be my major in college during my undergrad. So I have always been a musician for the time I was very small. I took my first piano lesson when I was seven um, and studied music all throughout school, did choir, orchestra, and got to my senior year. And I also was really interested in psychology, did a lot of volunteering with different service organizations and loved working with people and was really torn between a psychology major and a music major. But I knew I didn't want to be a performer. I didn't like the isolation of the practice room and the competitive nature of, um, you know, competing for a small number of orchestral positions and that just didn't really appeal to me just to interrupt you for a second yeah that's awful the Mm -hmm. the the way that 
music has so I'm interrupting you for a little bit longer. The Go for um, it. at University of Washington, there's a, a pretty robust music uh, school, and I uh, would I took a lot of classes in the music school with with my electives and my bachelor's degree, and the snootiness and the elitism <sighs> and the <sighs> the high com- competition, and and I I had friends who were in that they were actually music majors and the way they talked about music, I was just like, where's the fun, (laughs) you know, Mm -hmm. uh, where's the, where's the soul where, you know, music is something of the soul. It's not something of, you know, uh, elite etiquette where you have to play Chopin in a very, very specific way. And (laughs) you don't, you don't just sit back and listen like, Oh, that was a good song. It's like, well, this particular song by Chopin is played with this sort of surging of the rhythm. And if you don't do it that way, uh, I, I mean, I, I've, I think I've talked about some podcasts before. I had a good friend of mine who, who told me that he was evaluating an, an undergrad for their rendition of some song on piano because he was a piano uh, you know, doctorate student or something. And the, the rendition, the, the you know, person performing played something that wasn't in a style that was supposed to be played. And he got, he stood up in the middle of the performance and walked out of the, of the theater because, and and he was trying to explain to me like what, why he did that because it, and it felt right to him and people supported him. And I was just like, did it sound good? What I, and I was like, what I have noticed, he was like, no, you wouldn't have noticed. And I was like, well then what the fuck dude, like what's wrong with you? <laughs> and, and that, that's that, so real. And it's like, where's the school for musicians who just want to like create something soulful and interesting. And at least even just for the individual playing it, you know, like forget yeah. if it's interesting to other people, like, how about it just be interesting to one person? Like what's the diff? Uh, so yeah. Uh, so you ran into that in your, in your undergrad. Oh yeah. I mean, I did my bachelor's in music in music therapy and it was in a conservatory setting and I loved my education. I got a lot of training in classical music primarily. And those are all real things. I mean, that's a whole nother topic for conversation is the mental health of musicians or music students it's it's a tough field and um I think what really drew me to music therapy specifically was that I the thing that I had always really loved about music and you got a little bit to that is like it's about the soul it's about the experience of creating something beautiful and meaningful and then having an audience be a part of it by either receiving it or enjoying it in whatever way and I just loved that I loved the way music brought people together. I love the way it helped me get through challenging parts during my life. And it just sort of made sense intuitively. I didn't know, like, as I was going through my training, what my career would end up looking like because I didn't really know what music therapists do. But the more that I learned and the more I discovered um, that it was just the perfect fit for me in, in every way possible. And it was different. It was the focus of being a music therapist is really different than being a performer. Um, and it was much easier for me to identify with that than it was to um, think about all that competition and perfectionism that just didn't really resonate with me. So you knew you wanted to be a music therapist in your undergrad? Yeah. So there's an interesting kind of way that musician music therapists become board certified. I actually just did my bachelor's um, and it it was a four-year program. And then I did my internship. We have to do a six-month full-time internship that you apply to after you complete your four years and you receive your degree. And then after that, you get, you can receive board certification. So it's a certain number of like supervised clinical hours, but we actually did our practicum and all of our um, specific music therapy training while alongside all of this intensive music training that a typical bachelor's conservatory student would be receiving. So it was a tough four years. And that's one way to do it. The other way is to get a bachelor's in music or music education, music performance, music ed, and then go back and do a master's equivalency in music therapy. So it's the same training that I got in my bachelor's, just, you know, after the fact in a master's program. So my classes were 
um, a mix of bachelor's and master's students together. And we all were kind of going through the same training, but um, there's multiple routes to becoming a music therapist. So are you a licensed mental health person or is it, is it mainly the music therapy part? So I don't have a licensure. There are some music therapists who will have like an LPC or an MST or, or some other kind of counseling certification or even like SLP or which is speech language pathology or occupational therapy. So the field is diverse in just a lot of different ways. We're not necessarily always considered mental health professionals. There's a lot of us that work in rehab settings or in school settings, um, with special needs um, students. So our field is just looks different no matter <laughs> who you're talking to. Um, I have a board certification, so we're nationally regulated as music therapists. The credential is MTBC. And then, of course, my interest is in the field of psychology. So that's what leads me to pursue my clinical psychology doctorate. So your doctorate's going to be to train to be a psychologist? Correct. Yeah. yeah. And I, I plan on doing sort of an integrative, um, in my professional practice as psychology still be able to integrate music and music therapy when appropriate. Um, but I really like the idea of having kind of a, a combined approaches, both a psychologist and a music therapist, because they're really two very different fields with a lot to contribute. And it just makes sense to me to overlap. Yeah. I remember hearing about that training experience uh, from other music therapists where you, you know, like with art therapy, for example, because there's a lot of, there's an art therapy program. I, I actually teach a fair amount of art therapist uh, students and you are, a, you know, a part of your master's degree is expressing yourself through art, but it's not evaluated on a, uh, by judges, you know, they don't look at it and say, well, that's good art and that's shit art. Like, you know, it's just, it's, you do a lot of things for yourself in it and it's not, it's not judged that way. And you're, for you to graduate, you don't have to be a quote unquote, like fine artist in some way. Um, often they are, but they don't have to be. Whereas with music therapy, it's, uh, often as you describe where the musicians, uh, you know, as a music therapist, you have to really master, uh, I think, three instruments or something. Is is that how it goes? Yeah, it's your primary instrument. So in my case, it was viola. And then you also have to be proficient on guitar, piano, voice, and percussion. Right. And you have to be good. You have to, you have to demonstrate that you're proficient, that you're not mm -hmm. just you don't just show up and say like, okay, let's play the drums and you don't actually, you, you can't actually play the drums that well. Um, but you can play it well enough to be able to demonstrate it. Like for me, for example, I, I'm not very good on, you know, bongo type drums. I don't know. I don't even know the word for it, but like the kind of drums you hit with your hand, you know, I'm fairly hand okay percussion. with it. hand percussion. I'm, pr I'm pretty good with yeah. a drum kit, I would say, but, uh, I don't have a lot of experience with, the hand percussion. And if I were to run a music therapy group, I feel like I could pull it off. I, you know, I hand out a bunch of drums and I, I would have some sort of directive around like, okay, here's what we do. And yet I wouldn't be very good <laughs> myself. I couldn't, <laughs> I couldn't solo in, you know, in front of some judges to demonstrate that I actually knew how the technique and all that kind of stuff. Whereas for music therapists, they, they do have to demonstrate that. Is that right? Yeah, I mean, you'll see a wide variety of different levels of musicianship, even in our field. Um, and there's always that kind of question, like, what is proficient? Like, how do you, what's the objective way to determine someone's proficient at drum kit or piano? But overall, it's assumed that after you complete your internship and you enter the field, that you have a good handle on all of those instruments. So, like, you can pick up a guitar and play a song in four different keys and things like that, that are really essential skills to be able to be effective as a clinician. So if people want to become a music therapist, where should they go to get information for it? So if you're in the United States, you can go to the American Music Therapy Association website, which is musictherapy.org. 
and you'll be able to find a list of schools that are accredited that have music therapy programs and just fact sheets and information about the field. Um, that's a good place to start. Uh, last couple questions, uh, just kind of going back to our earlier discussion around your uh, advocacy to start these programs from scratch in the military. Uh, in your essay, you talked about running into certain barriers, and I know that we talked uh, af- you know afterwards, and you said you know you didn't want to go into the specifics, as you don't want to mm-hmm. burn burn any bridges. But do you want to describe anything that? Because uh, I I think that that's an important part of your story, an important part of anyone's uh, story when it and expectation when it comes to creating change is that often there are institutional barriers and culture barriers uh, that we run into that can be quite challenging. And without some strategy of, and without resilience, then that's kind of the end of the road for a lot of people. So what, do you want to talk about that at all? Yeah, no, I definitely will. It's a big part of, I think, my identity as a clinician at this point and um, has fostered a lot of resilience in me and has propelled me forward to learn more and um, encourage people to continue to pioneer and develop new things, even in the face of these difficult barriers. But um, just as a creative arts therapist, we're, we tend to be pretty marginalized just in the field of, of healthcare. And because we're oftentimes newer, have it, we're not as common. Maybe a lot of clinicians haven't encountered us in the workplace. And so we walk into a new space and, and say, Hey, we want to start this program. Um, this is what we need. And without knowing what it is that we have to contribute, that can create a lot of like, Oh, you know, we got to create a space now for this person. And it costs this amount of money for instruments and, Oh, like you're making too much noise. That's like, you know, causing annoyance with other clinicians on our team and interrupting patient care. Like there's so many small things that we have to take into consideration and really navigate um, in a compassionate way. But then also just on a systemic level, healthcare in general, I think is shifting um, to be more holistic and interdisciplinary and that can cause discomfort so it can cause some discomfort with clinicians who maybe been practicing in the field for many years in this sort of siloed approach you know you get an injury or an illness you go see this um, practitioner that's going to treat this body part where what we're finding and, and really the philosophy behind a lot of what music therapists do is that working on a team interdisciplinary collaborating co-treating um, works a lot better for the patient and that can also create some um territorialism, I guess. <laughs> and I know this is not just specific to creative arts therapy, it's that a, a lot of other fields experience this as well, um, where really it's hard to be collaborative and it's, it's hard when there's limited resources and there's little, limited funding and space and maybe even um, clients or patients or insurance panels that are going to pay for your services, billing codes, all of those things. Um, so those are some of the more systemic barriers. And then the last thing I'll mention about that is that the military system itself has a lot of difficulty in treating um, injuries or illnesses, especially post-traumatic stress disorder, just because of a general cultural stigma um, against receiving treatment. So the, the thought for a lot of service members of receiving care for a mental health disorder or illness um, can be career ending. And that is propagated across the whole department of defense is that if you report, um, you know, symptoms of post-traumatic stress disorder, you're going to be discharged from the army or, um, and that, that is a cultural shift that is, is happening and is slowly changing. But again, like these things don't take place overnight. We're seeing the beginning of, of shifts that will, you know, maybe fully manifest 10 years from now. Um, But it makes it really difficult. It makes it difficult to deliver services, to find people who will benefit from your services, and then to convince people that you have value to add to a clinical environment. So um, I'm 
really excited about just, you know, seven or eight years from where I started, it's been a lot easier. And that going up the chain of command into higher offices and even into the current presidential administration, there's been a lot of support for creative arts therapists that have made it um, substantially easier. So when people walk into a new facility and say, hey, we have this program to start and we have funding and we want to be able to provide services for the people that need it, they can say, oh, I've heard about the great work that you're doing and we've been waiting for this. Like We've been waiting for you to come and work with us versus that kind of like sideways <laughs> head tilt that we got um, for a long time. So yeah, are you specifically talking about Vice President Pence's wife uh, promoting art therapy? Yeah, yeah, that's been paramount in receiving congressional support for expanding across the country. Interesting. So, are you yeah. also getting your doctorate so you can have more power and clout to continue your advocacy for music therapy in, in the military? That's definitely a part of it. Um, I think having the knowledge just of having a greater scope of knowledge can help me articulate better what it is that I do and can help further identify research questions that maybe can be priority, not just for um, what I think is interesting as a music therapist, but maybe the economic impact of having creative arts therapies um, that might help these systems function better and um, return service members back to duty faster or just improve our systems as a whole. And these are like macro level issues that it's hard with your day to day working with clients um, to think about, but are really important. And I think that for me, just that level of awareness that creating something new and seeing all these challenges has uh, afforded me. And I'm really grateful for it because it motivates me to learn as much as I can and, and impact things on a more grander scale, I guess. Yeah. It's interesting that you talk about the, you know, the stigma and you were talking about that earlier and that obviously in our society, we have stigma around mental health, but in the military, you can literally be uh, discharged or demoted or relegated to um, less interesting jobs. If it is known that you came forward with some kind of mental condition. And there's this notion that it's like, well, if you, if you have a label in the DSM, you're like, you're crazy and you're mm -hmm. going to do all these horrible things when it, the, in all likelihood, 90% of people in the military qualify for a DSM label. And that when you, now for some people, if they're like psychotic and delusional, then yeah, maybe looking at their fitness for the job is in order. But if you suffer from depression or PTSD mm -hmm. or anxiety, uh, quite normal things to suffer from as a result of uh, some of the work in the military, then you should be rewarded for coming forward because you're being proactive right. uh, instead of being um, you know pushed aside and. And yeah, it's this really old school way of thinking that is to some extent prevalent in our society. So I'm glad that you're seeing some change in that. Um, you also mentioned competition in our field, which absolutely, I mean, one of the things that um, I just want to mention and, you know, I want to hear your thoughts on it is that, you know, as there was a time in, in my career when music therapy wasn't really a formalized profession and people would use music in therapy uh, when, when they felt that they were good enough to be able to do that. In the same way that drama therapy wasn't a profession when I started out, art therapy was barely a profession when I started out. And there's this siloing where people are starting to say, okay, unless you're an art therapist, you can't use art in therapy. Unless you're a music therapist, you can't use music in therapy. What do you think about that? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I feel that that way of thinking is, damaging to both our profession as music therapists, but also to the people that we're trying to serve. There's plenty of um, clinicians who are using music therapy or using music, not as a music therapist um, and not stepping outside of their scope. And the number of music therapists in the country are nowhere near um, going to be able to reach every person that could benefit potentially from 
um, the use of music and healing. And I think it's, it's worth thinking about ways that we can be more collaborative or that um, methods of using music. So like music listening during a, a tough procedure that might create a lot of pain for a patient. That's an easy way that um, a healthcare provider can utilize music that doesn't necessarily require the presence of a music therapist. Um, but also respecting kind of how the knowledge and training of music therapy makes us valuable and dynamic um, and honoring that space. But again, with, we don't own music as a profession. I know art therapists don't own art. <laughs> um, so I think it's the shifting mentality to be more collaborative rather than corrective. And um, I've had a lot of great experience working with community musicians and, and seeing how, you know, if I discharge a patient from music therapy and they found this great new tool that really helps them um, to be able to pass that person off to someone else who might help them continue that growth and learning, even if it's not in a therapeutic space. Is your dissertation going to be on music therapy, do you think? I hope so. I hope I, I don't know specifically. I have so many ideas, of course, and I'm sure that changes and <laughs> so many times before you land on um, a final idea. But I really, really would love to do some type of study on um, the combination of psychotherapy and music therapy, whether with military or other populations that are impacted by trauma. Lots of plans. <laughs> well, keep us updated because, uh, you know, the patrons and the psychology and Seattle team feel like we're a part of your education now. So, uh, yeah, so you that, absolutely are. I'll keep you in the loop. Yeah. Um, and yeah, I'd, you know, love to read your dissertation when it happens. Um, <laughs> cause one thing that happens, what you'll find is that you'll, you'll spend three years on your dis- dissertation. It, it, and you publish it, it's basically a little book or it could be a big book for some people and no one will read it. <laughs> um, my, except for your committee, I had a friend who said he, because usually they put your dissertation in the library of the university. Mm-hmm. And my friend said that he, whenever he goes back to his university, um, he checks his dissertation to see if anyone's even taken it off the shelf because he's put $20, he's put a $20 bill <laughs> in the, in the middle of the dissertation. And every time he goes back, it's, it's always there. Uh, so it's just, Oh it's no. Just kind of, yeah. I'm going to start opening random books in the library when I get there, people's dissertation, see if I can find <laughs> some extra money. <laughs> Spoken like a true college student. That's great. <laughs> Well, uh, thanks, Hannah, for coming on the podcast. Do, do you have any th- last things you want to say? I don't think so. Thanks for having me on. I'm, I'm really, I'm always really excited to talk about music therapy and feel free to anyone listening, if they want to know more, to reach out. Yeah. So can people find you on Twitter or Instagram or anything? Yeah, I'm on um, Instagram. I actually just started a new page with my hopefully future private practice side hustle music therapy while I'm in school. So you can find me at, at attunement, so A-T-T-U-N-E-M-E-N-T-T-X, attunement therapy or treatment. And um, you can you also send me an email at hb40290 at gmail.com. Well, thanks, Anna. Uh, congratulations on winning the scholarship and congratulations on all your wonderful work. I can see how you managed to convince all these people. You're very well-spoken and pleasant and convincing. And I'm oh, sure that you. Uh, took you, uh, you know, and will continue to take you far. So yeah, stay in touch and let us know how you're doing. Okay. Absolutely. All right, people. If you want to contact Hannah, you can contact her on Instagram at attunement TX. And please take care of yourself because you deserve it. You really, really do.